Okay, I'm here. I'm going to talk to you about uh, Coolbot. Now, Coolbot is uh, supposed to be a low cost uh, solution to post harvest losses, especially in perishable commodities. But before I talk about the Coolbot and my pet subject of post harvest losses, I'd like to take you through my life story, my journey to be a scientist. After I finished my high school, and qualified to join university, I was very excited. Life was looking very promising for me. The future looked bright. I was looking forward to, I was the first girl in my village to have qualified to go to university. So I was the talk of my village. My star was rising, but just when things were looking so good for me, disaster struck. I was diagnosed with end-stage renal failure. Yes, my kidneys had failed. So for me, that was a moment of hopelessness, despair. I resigned myself to fate because I didn't know what this meant for me. So I was started on renal dialysis. If you know what dialysis is, it means they get out your blood from the body, they clean it out, they, they clean it using a dialyzer and they return the blood to the body. That didn't look like, you know, a life that I had envisaged for myself. So I was on dialysis. So by the time my letter of admission to go to University of Nairobi to study agriculture came, for me, I was wondering, really, go and study agriculture? Why would I start this journey that I, I'm sure I'll never see the end? So I was desperate. I remember when I reported to, to the Faculty of Agriculture in Kabete campus, I walked to the dean's office and I told the dean, you know what? I've been admitted to agriculture, but I can't do agriculture. Look at me. At that point, I was really frail. The dialysis was taking a toll on me. So I told the dean that, you know what? I need to change my course to education. For me, I thought education was going to be easy on me. Yeah, because I figured out, I, for me, my perception of agriculture was farming. I imagined that as part of training in agriculture, I would be expected to plow some piece of land. I imagined myself with a hoe, plowing some piece of land. I imagined myself on a tractor, and that just, it wasn't going to be possible. So I told the dean, you know what, I need to change. The dean looked at me and he told me, Jane, Agri agriculture is the best course you could have chosen to do. He told me, look at myself. That was the dean then. He was called Professor Daniel Mukunya. Look at me. Would you like to be like me? And I said, of course I would like to be like you, Dean. But maybe in my dreams, really. Because I couldn't imagine myself professor in this state. No. So anyway, the dean insisted that, you know what, go back to class. You cannot change your, your program. You'll do agriculture because it is good. It's good enough. You can't be me. You go to class, work hard, and purpose to be like me. So I went back to class, of course. It's not like I was, I, he had convinced me, but did I have an option? Because I didn't have a transfer letter. So I went and studied agriculture. I struggled through first year. Yes. I had, of course, I had one leg in class and one leg in Kenyatta Hospital because I had to go for dialysis three times a week. So at the end of first year, a whole year in the, on dialysis, it had taken a toll. And the doctors told me that, you know what, Jane, you need a kidney transplant because dialysis is taking a toll. So what did a transplant mean? It meant I needed to raise money. One, I needed someone to donate the kidney to me. So... Wow, that was grim. Same dean, Professor Mukunya, he organized a fund drive at the university, and we raised money for my kidney transplant. My family, they were all uh, tested for compatibility, and thank God, one of my sisters matched me, and she was gracious enough to offer to donate her kidney to me. So uh, in January 1993, 12th, we both went under the knife, and you got the transplant. Yes? Well, I've been well to the, to the theater. I remember I looked up and I told myself, who knows if I'll come out of that theater life? 
I said almost bye to the world. But I came out, and we both came out well. And that for me was a turning point. It was a turning point because I believed that God had given me another chance in life. So my hopelessness, my despair, my resignation was turned into hope, purpose, and determination. I knew I have to do something with my life. I went back to class. If you look at my first year transcript, it is graced with D's and C's. You'll understand why. I only attended half of the lectures. Second year, so in between uh, first year and second year, that's when I had the transplant. So when I got into second year, I told myself, you know what? Those D's and those C's are going to be A's and B's minimum. So I put my best foot forward and I studied. I completed the bachelor's degree, top of my class. I got a scholarship to go and study master's and another one to go and do PhD. And now the, I remember the words of the dean. Do you want to be like me? And I said, at this point in time, that looked like reality. It's possible. It is within reach for me. And I told myself, you know what? One day, and you watch this space, one day, I'll be the dean of agriculture. One of these fine days. So that is the science. So I went through this, and it got me to where I am, a scientist. So my purpose, my area of research in, uh, uh, in agriculture, specifically in horticulture, is post-harvest science and technology. And you want to ask yourself, why post-harvest science and technology? Okay. At this point, I want to acknowledge the African women in agricultural research and development. They're part of my journey that, are, that has helped me to shape this focus. Why am I so interested in post-harvest science and technology? Now, as you see on the slide that is cast there, I believe that we have focused so much on production. We are producing. The breeders are doing their part. We have very good breeds of uh, crops and animals. We have high quality. The agronomists have done their part. We can produce the potential that is realized through breeding. So we have good quality. You can see the square, water, uh, the square watermelon there. That is science. That is technology, that we can achieve anything we want. But I realize that there's one part of the supply chain that has been neglected, and that is what happens to this produce after it has been harvested, okay? And just like the previous speakers, we are really interested in helping our smallholder farmers to realize they are in, because we're spending so much, yes? We're spending so much to produce good quality crops, but as the slide you can see over there, it is pointing to the fact that not all of what is produced ends up, to the, ends up uh, on the table, production. I want to draw your attention to a report that was, that was recently produced by the Food and Agriculture Organization. Now this report, this, the, the statistic that is cast there on the slide is drawn from this report. This report on food losses and waste in the context of sustainable system has information about the level, the extent of losses. It's not the only report that has been done, but the other reports that have been done before. Now, th this report points to the fact that a third of the food that is produced, that is 1.2 billion tons of the food that is produced is wasted along the supply chain. Now, it gets worse for fruits and vegetables because of their high perishability. That is almost 50% of the fruits and vegetables produced are wasted, lost or wasted. Now that means for every two fruits that are produced, one ends on the table, the other one ends where? In the dustbin. Now if that doesn't click, if that doesn't warrant action, I don't know what does. That is why I'm so interested in this topic. Now you want to ask yourself, why are we having such high losses? There are very many factors that are driving these losses all the way from production to the consumption, cons consumption stage, okay? So I will not labor. Time won't allow me to highlight all these factors. But then one of the key things that is contributing to these losses is lack of storage. Most of our farmers, I don't know about your rural areas, the farmers are suffering. It, it, uh, you realize in some, in, in some farm situation, you find the best a farmer has for a store is someplace under a tree. 
Now, corn storage is so critical, it's so important in managing uh, in the post-harvest handling of perishable commodities. Why is corn storage so important? Now, if you look at the slide that is cast over there, I did a little experiment to just show how important coal storage is for perishable commodities. I took a batch of, uh, two batches of skumawiki, that is kelps. I put uh, one batch in the refrigerator at eight degrees centigrade, and the other batch I left it at ambient room conditions. Now, if you can look at the, the, that slide over there, you can see the difference that coal storage is making. I'm sure you can see that. Within two days, of storage under ambient conditions, the skooma was unsellable. It was yellow, it was wilted. If you look at the, the skooma that was stored at eight degrees in the refrigerator, it was by 16 days, it was still as fresh as it was at the beginning. And we could still continue to store it much longer. That means that tells you how important corn storage, among other factors, is key in post harvest handling of perishables. Okay, so now, if uh, cold storage is that important, how come the farmers are not using it? Why, why are the farmers not adapting the cold storage facilities that are, that are there? Conventional cold rooms are there, but can our farmers afford these cold rooms? Can they? Maybe not. This, this school board is actually an innovation of a smallholder farmer. I want to introduce to you Ron Kolsler. Ron Kolsler is a smallholder farmer in the U.S. who, faced with the same challenges as our smallholder farmers, he thought outside the box. Yes? Because coal storage, I mean, he's a smallholder farmer. Conventional coal rooms were out of reach for him. So he thought out of the box. Now, Ron figured out that when you have uh, an AC, air conditioner, fitted into a room, like this one, I don't know if this one is air conditioned. Usually it is set, the temperature is set to be, minimum is 18 degrees centigrade, okay? Now that is good enough, it makes you comfortable, but it's not good enough for perishable commodities like fruits and vegetables. So Ron figured out if in fact, what is keeping that temperature at 18 minimum is a thermostat. Is there a way you can go around that thermostat and force this uh, AC to work harder and cool the room to much lower temperatures. So Ron invented the cool board. So the cool board, as you can see there, is a little gadget as I've shown there. When it is fitted onto a standard AC, it overrides the thermostat in the AC. So just using the AC, which with the thermostat can only heat up to or cool up to 18 degrees. But with the air, with the cool board, you can set the, the cool board to make the AC lower the temperature to as much as you want, okay? So the figures over there on the left is your, cool, your insulator. The key thing in uh, the cool board technology is an insulation, okay? You look on your left, that is uh, a newly constructed room, insulated, fitted with an AC and a cool board. Now, what is the cost of the cool board? It could range from $1,000 to as much as you can, as it can, depending on the level of sophistication, sophistication that you're using for the, uh, that you want for your cool board, okay? So basically, you can make it as cheap as you can, but you can also make it expensive. So for smallholder farmers, of course, you want it as cheap as possible. Now, farmers in Bangladesh, which is this scenario in Bangladesh is not unique because we have the same scenario in Kenya. You've heard of farmers in uh, potato producing areas in Kinangop, Molo. They produce potatoes. When they're in season, the middlemen buy from them. And then a few months later, they have to buy them for much higher price. That is the same scenario for smallholder farmers in Bangladesh. So given the fact that the cool board has been there, it's been introduced, myself and a team of researchers from uh, University of Nairobi, Professor Hutchinson, Dr. Willie Zowino, uh, some researchers from Kari, Dr. Lu uh, Lusike, and a team from, the, from UC Davis, uh, Ms. Britta Hansen and uh, Michael Reed, we teamed up, and teamed up and said, you know, can we pilot this technology in Kenya? And when there was a call from Kenya Feed the Future Innovation Engine, we put in a bid to, 
pilot this technology in Kenya. And we're glad that we are given that grant and we're actually piloting this technology in, in Kenya. We are currently in Makueni. Makueni because I've been working with the mango farmers in Makueni and I feel their pain. They lose the weight for their mango crop a whole season. And then when now, like now mango is coming into season, the amount of losses these farmers in car is unacceptable. So something has got to be done. So I'm working with these farmers. The, the, the slide that is over there shows our pilot uh, project. So this is preliminary work. We have stored some tomatoes and kales there. We just wanted to see, does this cool board actually work? And how effective is it to cool the produce? So I am glad to report that for the pilot phase, it is perfect. We could cool the room to as low as 10 degrees. So of course, we don't want to get it too much low, uh, lower than 10 degrees because uh, of chilling injury. So we were able to cool our room and our produce has been stored long enough, which makes a whole lot of difference for the smallholder farmers who we are targeting. What is the biggest challenge we are facing in Makweni in some of the rural areas? Electricity. Because electricity in most rural areas is not there. If it's not there, if it's there, it is unstable. And in Makweni, that is the challenge you're facing. So looking forward for the cool board, what is the future of the cool board? We're thinking if indeed it's going to benefit the smallholder farmers in Makweni, for example, we want a solar-powered AC. Can you think about that? I know in there we have all the expertise we need. Kenya, we are blessed, we, are, we have expertise. Solar powered AC, we're thinking that will solve our power situation in Makweni and the rural areas. The other thing for the cost of the cool board, like I said, insulation is critical, okay? Now for our cold room that we, uh, we piloted in Makweni, we have used uh, structure insulated panels from, uh, which are made from polyester. Now that is not very cheap. So it has made our cool board a little bit expensive than we thought. But there are other low cost options. Actually, we figured, we've figured out from literature that feathers, can you imagine, chicken feathers can do some insulation. The key thing for us is to bring the cost down. Bring the cost, because if insulation is what is making it very expensive, we've got to bring the cost down. And I'm glad to report that we've been working with the Fab Lab of University of Nairobi because for our project, we had to ship in the cool boards from the US. Now that is not very sustainable if we are hoping to roll out this nationally and to benefit each and every farmer or groups of farmers. So we, we worked with the, the Fab Lab of University of Nairobi. They helped us to fit the cool board for our pilot project. But again, we are in talks. The owner of the technology, Ron Kolsler, does not mind to have this cool board assembled in Kenya. Actually, if you look at that cool board, it's really not a complicated thing. And when the people from FabLab looked at it, they said, this is so easy. They can actually assemble it. But is it possible for them to assemble the cool board under license? Now, so those are the thoughts that you're going through, because I see cool board making a whole lot of difference. But for it to make that desired difference, we got to make it cost effective and affordable for the smallholder farmers. So that is where we're going. So this is food, thought, food, of, food for thought for you, researchers in there. We need to roll out the cool board to, uh, to each and every farmer. And let us get involved in this topic, in this desire to reduce food losses and food waste in our agricultural food value chains. Thank you.